This year we really haven't had John introduce the speakers, which is too bad because it, first of all, gives the speakers something to respond and to defend, defend themselves as they talk, um, given John's introduction. So I sort of missed that. Um, you'll have to ask him for what he would have said sometime when you see him and take a break. Like Rich, I decided that I would wear a costume today, partially because my talk is very much coming out of my discipline, and not only my discipline, but a particular way of thinking that is well represented by what I have on. So most of you don't know me, so you haven't abused me yet about this, though the returning students have already abused me just because I had nice pants on, let alone a tie. But I think that, I guess I will give you a warning. I don't know, I think it's in maybe in The Farmer's Daughter where Jim Harrison says that one has every right in our time to develop suspicions about those who wear a suit and tie. Um, for those of you who went down to Wall Street, you may even feel that more strongly. But I think it's pr appropriate for what I'll be talking. And what I want to do today is talk about how our legal system interacts with nature. And I'll come back to that theme in a couple places you know, throughout. But you know, we sort of building on some of what John and Rich and Catherine introduced in terms of how we think about nature, how we have thought about nature. I'm hoping to look at that intersection of where sort of nature and society sort of come together and integrate smoothly or, or perhaps clash. And you'll notice coming in here that the room isn't dark. Actually, those blinds are still down. You can pull them if you want. Um, I actually want lots of light in here. Because um, I decided not to use a PowerPoint, because I even, and which is a little hard, because I've just spent the last week and a half with my section talking about how important visual narratives are and how you can use, you know, images to convey a message, and it's tempting to do that because it really is powerful. But in some ways, because I'm, I'm trying to stay in my role a little bit, is I want you to, I want to make this argument. Verbally, I want to use words. That's the, the tools of the profession that I come from. And is both as a subliminal and maybe a more emotional and powerful way to get at things. I'm going to use words. And plus, it's a beautiful day. It would be nice not to be in the dark. Thank you. So on the other hand, I am going to use a visual aid, not PowerPoint. I'm going to use something that's really low tech. I've got a rock. It's not even a pet rock. I've got a rock that I want to use to try to convey some of the ideas that I have. And part of it is this rock has legal status in our society, right? This rock is, does intersect with the legal system. It's something that I own. I can use this rock as a tool. I can, you know, if this microphone wasn't working, I could smack things with it. I could break the rock. It's actually kind of a pretty rock. I could break it into small pieces and sell them to you guys at overpriced um, amounts down in Bar Harbor. I could, if I wanted, I could destroy this rock completely. Or I could, use, you know, using my energy and talents, make it into something really valuable that all of you would want and you can't have because it's my rock. And our Western legal tradition has traditionally seen this rock as an object. You know, meaning that the rock is something that can be acted upon, but it in and of itself doesn't, isn't really a subject of the legal system. You know, as a, people are subjects of the legal system. As a person or any of you, have you know, rights and responsibilities that our legal system has, you know, has granted you or that you are endowed with by your creator under the deck. But you have rights and responsibilities. This rock has absolutely no rights and no responsibilities in our legal system. And that's important because it's not only that this rock doesn't have legal rights or responsibilities, but the tree outside or the trees on the side in the mountain in Acadia, or animals that live in Acadia, or animals perhaps even that live in a house or on a farm, 
also don't necessarily have legal rights. In fact, the entire mountain doesn't have legal rights. And if you witness a mountaintop removal, you know, I can, in the same way, I can own this rock and do things with it. The top of a mountain off, grind it up, ship it someplace, and burn it to make electricity to, you know, turn the lights on in this auditorium. And so that's one of the things that I wanted, you know, to talk about because it's really important in terms of that intersection between law and nature. And I had you read the Sand County Almanac, I'm, um, just a chapter called The Land Ethic. And I'll return to some of those ideas a little bit. Hopefully you've had a chance in your sections to talk about them or you will talk about them. But in the foreword to the book, Aldo Leopold sort of states in some ways the obverse to the, the land ethic piece. What he says is that we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. And in that same way, you know, law treats this thing as property. And that relationship between us and this thing, or this thing, or the mountain, or whatever, that therein lies the problem that I want to try to address today, is that relationship between them is structured by the legal system. So backing up for a second, you know, the role of law in society, I teach entire classes on this, so this is going to be a really quick you know, introduction to the whole idea. But law does a couple different things in society. Sorry, I talk too much during ACM, I think. So law both reflects and shapes society. So when I use the term law, I mean, I, Catherine talked about social co constructs last week. Law is clearly a social construct. It's something that, that we create that I would argue reflects the values, um, beliefs, maybe the aspirations even of a group of people, of a community. And COA has law. You know, some of those laws are imposed from the outside, but there are also laws that we develop ourselves through the ACM process or through the Board of Trustees, which are meeting this weekend if you want to see them do some of that, um, or that you know, we developed and then they're put in the handbook and you've seen them. We also have laws that are developed by custom, the things that have been done over time, over a long period of time and everybody ab abides by, and that sort of sense of, of shared expectations, shared obligations that we've constructed. So that's you know, one way that law acts in society. And I would argue, even on bleak days, that in many ways the law says a lot about what people and what society itself is. You know, at the same time, law also shapes society. And a way to think about that is if you can imagine our legal system, and I probably could use a PowerPoint prop at this point, but if you can imagine the PowerPoints that Catherine showed last week up behind me, one of those paintings on a wall. Okay, that's our sort of political and legal system, um, those societal values we talk about. Law, in many ways, acts the same way as that frame does around the picture. It, sort of delineates part of where even our minds can go. You know, when we look at a painting, and I'm really quickly getting out of my league, I don't know if Catherine's here or not, but, you know, when we look at a painting and even talking about those paintings mean, we almost never look at the frame. No one was talking about the frame. People also weren't talking about, well, why is the, fra why is the painting square? Why is the frame square? Why isn't it round? You know, why is the painting hanging on a wall? There's a painting there that's hanging on a wall. Why isn't it just painted on the wall? In fact, what about the wall? I mean, why are we just focused on that, that painting? What's inside the gold, you know, thing over there with, I guess that's Thomas Gates probably looking out at us. Um, you know, that the frame does something to the viewer. And I would argue that law does the same thing. And the thing that's perhaps insidious about that, is that we don't even necessarily realize that that's happening, that somehow that frame, when we talked about the pictures that 
Catherine showed last week, that you know that frame has sort of limited not only what we see, but perhaps even the questions we ask and the things that we can see. And I would argue that in many ways, law does that in society. And I'll probably give some explicit examples that certainly limit my way of viewing, may not limit yours as much because in, you haven't necessarily been trained in the same sorts of things. And so perhaps they're more open to seeing the frame or seeing beyond it. So because consciously or unconsciously, our ability to sort of view the broader world is limited by that frame, it creates a challenge. And specifically with law, and for me, the, the issue that the core course in human ecology poses you know, specifically is that society has changed tremendously over the last 300 years since the property laws sort of setting forth you know, what this thing is were developed. I mean, there's property before that, but they took a particular tone about 250, 300 years ago. Um, is that my cue? Anyway, <laughs> that's OK. You know, in the firmament of time, you guys read Lauren Isley's account of some of those changes. And it really nicely, the readings that Catherine gave sort of reiterated those, as did some of the, the human ecology essays that you read, where you know, fundamentally, there's been a revolution in the way we think about nature, in the way we think about the world. I mean, Darwin, you know, aside from the battles of you know, whether evolution should be taught in school, you know, fundamentally, Darwin's ideas really are revolutionary and change the way in which both we think about ourselves in the world, but also think about the world. And like I said, Isley documented that you know, in, in, in great detail. But those changes have occurred, and the legal system really has not kept up. I think, John, I think this is in your writing in Sauntering Toward Bethlehem. John says at one point that the law should be really suspicious of natural historians. And he talks about them like roaming around in ditches and things like that. But he's, he's absolutely right. Not necessarily because they're sort of vagrants and dirty and whatever else, and they're out you know, in ditches. But because natural historians sort of you know, bring, sort of carrying that legacy of Darwin forward are actually raising some truths or questions that are outside the frame. They're actually posing some problems that, for my conception of the world, that is shaped like this in terms of what property means and what I, my role as a human is, are start to get challenged. And in that way, natural historians are incredibly dangerous because they undermine that whole foundation for this entire kind of legal framework that's been set up. And I don't know if that's what John meant, but it's certainly true. I think that in some ways, Leopold's land ethic you know, captures that same idea. I mean, it's really an expostulation on that whole idea that what he sees is an inevitable consequence of the ecological uh, revolution. And what he says is an ecological interpretation of history shows that man is a member of nature, is a member of a, a community that includes these other things, including my friend, right? And you know, Leopold's ideas are fundamentally really radical in that sense, even though they're you know, written more than 50, more than 60 years ago. OK. So a big question, and here I did need some other props, so I'm going to send these out, is, you know, is that change reflected in law? You know, the stuff, I'm going to start these in the, some at the back. That should be good enough. 
So send around, share with neighbors if you don't have them. I just printed up some things because I think it'll be easier. This is the one place where having a chalkboard that was bigger or a screen may have been really helpful. Um, my question is, so is the, all the stuff you read about in Isley, the things that Catherine talked about, about art being affected and fundamentally changed by the ideas of evolution and natural selection, the understanding we have of ecology, the, the movement towards human ecology, has that in any way started to fray that frame a little bit or bend it, make it rounder, or perhaps pull pieces out of it and make it different? And my answer is, yeah, maybe kind of, a little tiny bit. And what I did is I went through some particular laws that I know in the United States that start to do some of that. And just gave you some relevant excerpts. But I want to read them because I think they're relevant, partially because of what they say, partially because of what they don't say, but even more so because this is like the best I could find. So that says something in of itself. OK, so an early example, and these are not or in the order listed on your sheet, but an early example is the Wilderness Act, 1964, We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of it in a year or two. And anyway, the Wilderness Act sought to, in the quote, assure that an increasing population accompanied by expanding settlement and growing mechanization does not occupy and modify all areas within the United States with no lands designated in their natural condition. So that was the goals, one of the goals of the Wilderness Act, is to try to recognize nature as maybe being, that there may be something in this legal framework beyond just us. In the act, it defines these places as wildernesses. And then it goes forward on, onward to define wilderness. And this is actually one of my favorite legal passages, so I have to read it. So a wilderness, in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain, where land retains its primeval character and influence and generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable. Not bad. It's an attempt at another worldview. And I left some of the definitions out. I mean, we didn't go too far. It, it says you know, it has to be more than 5,000 acres. There's a bunch of sort of practical things. We don't want nature getting out of control completely. But you know, 50 years ago, there's an attempt to take some of those ecological ideas and maybe merge them into or somehow bring them into a legal frame that that's, hasn't embraced them before. Um, four years later, Congress decided to try to protect um, segments of rivers in the United States. And so in 1968, it declared that certain selected rivers of the nation shall be preserved in, free, in a free-flowing condition, and that they and their immediate environment shall be protected for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations. Still very anthropocentric. You know, humans are the center of this, this law. But it actually thinks about humans who aren't born yet, which is, which is something. It's some recognition of, of passage of time of people who aren't immediately able to own the rock but may come somewhere down the road that we have an obligation to, that we don't really have to dam every river. We could leave some of these, these free-flowing rivers, that there's some value in a river that is actually flowing like a river sh did or should. A um, few years later, the National Environmental Policy Act. It tries to go further, and it, the NEPA, is that it's called National Environmental Policy Act, the acronym. It's one of the early acronyms. NEPA you know, was created about the same time COA was. And you can actually see some similarities in the language. If you look, some of you in class have looked at old catalogs, you can see some of the, the parallelism. But Congress tries to go a little bit further and recognize some of the connectedness between humans and the natural world. 
In NEPA, Congress declares that we're going to have a national policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment, and that will fulfill the social, economic, and other requirements of present and future generations of Americans. That's not bad. That really is suggesting that we're going to try to bring these two worlds together. The challenge with NEPA, unfortunately, is that the courts had no clue what to do with it. I mean, it really, in some ways, was, was alien to them. And the way the courts ended up reading NEPA was something very procedural, because courts understand procedure. They understood Congress was trying to protect certain things. But you know, to really bring the natural and human world together, you know, they couldn't even really conceive how that would work. So what they've tended to focus on is the requirement of an environmental impact statement, which you've all probably heard about. So if I'm going to build you know, a giant dam in Acadia National Park, at least the National Park Service has to think about the alternatives and what the consequences will be before they build the dam. Not, earth, you know, not radical, not, certainly not rocket science, but it was a step because before then, they just built the dam and then thought about the consequences afterwards. So this NEPA, as the courts interpreted, does that. Not much of, a, of, of an ecological revolution in law but a little bit of one, and the language was there, but not one that they could fully develop. OK. So moving just forward a little further in time, and it's sad that this list stops in 1973, but we can talk about that later. One law that ostensibly thinks beyond humans altogether is, or at least thinks beyond humans to other species, is the Endangered Species Act in 1973. And you know, after acknowledging, and I think I put this language in there, that human action has caused some species to go extinct, and that that's, you know, not paying attention to those things was, a bad, was bad, that, that we're going to try to do something about it as a society. So what they've done, or what Congress did, was to say, OK, any time you have a government action, you know, some agency that's moving, this is at a federal level, some federal government action, we want to ensure that it's not going to jeopardize the continued existence of a threatened or endangered species. So that you know, we'll, for some species, not all, we're going to get rid of some species that are pests or that are common or we don't really care about. But for some species, other than humans, we're going to say, OK, they get certain protections. And we're going to, you know, at least maybe not the individuals, but the species as a whole, we're not going to wipe off the face of the earth. Again, doesn't sound incredibly radical, but judging by the fights that continue to this day, it is a very radical statute. I can't imagine that the Congress we have right now could ever pass anything like this. And the fact that every year someone proposes to defund it, to repeal it, to amend it, to ignore it, in the case of our governor, um, makes me think that it's still highly contested. This one, this particular statute, the courts actually did know what to do with it. Um, you know, cases came before the courts, including the, the US Supreme Court. They looked at this language and said, you know, Congress said that agencies can't jeopardize the continued existence of a species. Um, I, that seems like it's pretty clear, and we should enforce that. And in the case of a, a large dam in Tennessee, they said, you can't build the dam, which you know, was, I mean, they also said at the same time, we can't believe Congress really said this, but it seems like that's what they said, and we're sure Congress is going to you know, change the law. Congress didn't actually change the law. And the Endangered Species Act, like I said, is one of those places that fundamentally challenges that view, perhaps not how this thing is perceived. The rock is still out of luck, even though this was, at one point, you know, a living, living being. It's petrified wood. Um, the rock is out of luck. But if something gets on that list, it's got a special protection. So those are. Not very bright glimmers. You're sitting there thinking, right, this is, this is as best as he can do. But those are some glimmers of how 
perhaps those ideas that Leopold, Isley, and others have talked about make their way into the legal system. The other place where this happens, and this relates to the other reading I gave you, is what happens in the courtroom. To what extent can nature, in some form or fashion, enter the legal system? And this, this again, clearly limited by my frame and the frame of my profession, but the whole notion of having legal rights requires some ability to implement those rights, or if those rights are abrogated, if somebody takes advantage of them, we could pull down the blind on there so you're not totally blinded. You OK? OK. Yeah, sorry. Sort of bring sun in here. Um, you know, so if you've got a legal right, but there's no way to enforce it, there's no way to see that it's implemented, there's no way that if somebody violates it, that you can do anything about it, then you know, it's a wonderful moral claim. You know, I'm glad it's out there. But from a lawyer, from the people who wear these, it's like, oh, great, thank you. That's good. Now, next, we'll deal with you know, real things. So that question of you know, having some sort of legal right really means, again, from my, you know, from my discipline, is how do you actually implement it? How does it become something that has meaning in terms of the societal framework that we've created. And that's the whole issue of standing. So you know, it's a term that some of you may have heard before. In some ways, it's a very esoteric term. But in other ways, it's fundamental to understanding what a right would be. You know, to have a legal right to you know, water, which is something I do work on, you know, if there's no way you can enforce that, then it's great. It's a great political tool. It's a great platitude, it helps you when you're really indignant when people don't have access to water, but it's not a legal right that's in some ways can be enforced and perhaps made people change their behavior. So the whole idea of standing is, um, let's see if I can do this. The best way that I can sort of epitomize it is to have you do like a mental picture. And for some of you who have seen pictures of the Supreme Court justices, this might be easier. For others, if you can imagine a slightly overweight, balding Italian man who, who frowns a lot, standing at the front of a courtroom door like this. So imagine a bouncer at a nightclub. You guys are probably too young for that. Imagine a bouncer you've seen in a movie at a nightclub you know, with a really big guy standing there like this in front of the door. Okay? And I use the Italian guy be not because I have any particular nationality preferences or prejudices, but because Justice Scalia, who's currently on the Supreme Court, is an adamant, um, almost doctrinaire opponent of standing, of giving access to courts for anybody that he doesn't like, which includes most living things other than corporations. Anyway, sorry, political ad. Um, anyway, not my favorite justice. But if you can imagine Anton standing there like this, and somebody comes up to the courtroom door and wants to come in. And he basically, I actually said this in a law review article, he asks them, he has a bouncer voice, you know, well, what's it to you, bub? You know, why should I let you in this door? And Anton, unlike the Justice Scalia, unlike the, um, the bouncer, you know, actually has a basis. He pulls out you know, a copy of the US Constitution and says, well, according to the US Constitution, under Article 3, which sets up the judiciary, federal courts cannot hear things unless there's a case or controversy. And it's something we sort of inherit, you know, baggage that came over from England, like a lot of other things this particular legal concept was enshrined in the Constitution. And you know, Justice Scalia would say right here, hmm, OK, you know, if you have an economic interest, you know, that's, you've got skin in the game. You can come in. You know, if you have a constitutional right, you know, I don't really believe in most of those, but you know, it says in this Constitution that you're allowed to enforce them. OK, you can come in. The rest of you guys, yeah, I'm sorry, this, this isn't. This isn't for you. Go down the street. You, know, you can go down to the political 
area, you can go down to the, you know, the legis state legislature or to Congress, and they can address your problem, but those of us in the courts can't. Defending Justice Scalia, which this may be the only public time I've ever done this, um, you know, part of what he's worried about is he doesn't want you know, sort of gadflies coming up and saying, well, you know, I think that this is a court case and I should be able to come in and argue what's essentially a political issue in front of the court. The court is trying to protect itself so that it really hears things where it has two people or two organizations or two entities that really are you know, engaged in a fight over a decision. And that decision matters to them. So they're going to put everything in their power into that to try to get that resolved. And so that from a judge's point of view, having, that, having a case come that really is between two parties where they have to make a decision, it's clearly articulated. Neither party is trying to throw the game is really important. And having it not just be an objection to you know, the war in Afghanistan, but to a violation of a specific you know, prohibition on torture, for example, or a particular statute or something like that, you know, a law that's been passed. Courts want those things focused because that's what courts do. Courts resolve disputes. And he wants the disputes to be real. Part of the problem is Justice Scalia and I have very different definitions about what a real dispute is. And part of that's ideological because there's some disputes that he wants left in the political realm because he likes the result that occurs there and doesn't want the courts mucking it up. So anyway, so if you've got that image in your head, that was going on in the Sierra Club versus Morton case. Okay? Um, Justice Scalia wasn't on the court then. Um, who knows how it would have come out. But you know, that's the, the, basically the issue that's, that's before the court is you know, the guy who's standing here, you know, who do, as I block my mic, um, you know, who will they let in the door and who won't they let in the door? OK, so in Sierra Club versus Morton, what's, what's the bad environmental thing that's happening? You want to yell out? Yeah, so they want to build a ski resort. Where do they want to build it? OK, what? OK, there you go. Um, yeah, so in the Sierras, um, in an area that's actually owned by all of us in this room, because it's public land, it's national forest land, which we have a lot of ski resorts in national forest lands. But this case, they were going to lease the land to the Disney Corporation, who was going to build a spectacular ski resort. This was sort of Disney's entree into that world. One can only imagine what it might have been like. Um, and it was big, right? So it was like 14,000 people a day, you know, $35 million. This is $1960, so that's real money. Um, you know, worth of hotels and skating rinks and beauty parlors and all those things that go with, with ski resorts. Right? I, this probably belies also my prejudice against ski resorts. But anyway, um, so they were going to build this massive um, development in this valley. And uh, you might bug Davis to have him show you pictures of it. Um, it is really spectacularly beautiful. The other piece about it that just is a detail but is interesting in terms of who got sued in this case is that in order to build the ski resort, they had to build a road and a high power you know, transmission lines across a national park, in this case, Sequoia National Park. So in order to build it, they had to you know, cut a road and put lines across it. Sequoia is much bigger than Acadia, but you can see why there might be an issue there. And is Secretary Morton is the Secretary of Interior. He's the guy responsible for national parks. And so fundamentally, he and the Forest Service, which is in a separate agency, are saying, OK, yeah, this is a good idea. The Sierra Club, on the other hand, is saying, no, bad idea. Bad. They're, they're, like, they're with Davis. This is like the most beautiful place on Earth. Do not touch it. Um, in fact, they actually wanted to use NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, to argue that it wasn't appropriate for it to be built. So they come to the courtroom door. They've got the bouncer standing there. What does the bouncer do? What was the result in the case? Could you tell? 
Yeah, the, the bouncer kicked them out. He said, no, you don't have standing. Did he say to the Sierra Club, you've got to have an economic interest in this, you, you know, you, or some constitutional right? You just, we're not going to let you in the courtroom door because you just don't have you know, financial interests in this thing? Could you tell? No, he didn't. The court actually, and this, was, this part was sort of revolutionary. The court said, Supreme Court of the United States said, you know, aesthetics, the environment, spiritual values, those are all real interests. And those are harms that some group can suffer, or some individual can suffer. And therefore, you can come in the court when you've got just those claims. You don't have to have money at stake. You don't have to be harmed economically. And in that way, in some ways, the Sierra Club versus Morton case was a great victory, because that was the first time the Supreme Court had said that. And that was important. But that wasn't what the Sierra Club was actually trying to get out of this case. What was the Sierra Club trying to argue? And it, it was, it was saying, well, nature has rights, and we are the group that can represent those rights in the courtroom. Okay? So for those of you who are familiar with the Lorax sort of, you know, Dr. Seuss, I mean, I would call it sort of the Lorax approach. You know, Sierra Club comes up to the door, sing, you know, if you don't know the Lorax, you may not appreciate it, but he's about, you know, short guy with whiskers. And his thing is, you know, I speak for the trees, right? So he's coming up to the door saying, I speak for the trees, I speak for the trees, and let me in. And basically, you've got the bouncer drop kicks him out into the street somewhere. He just rejects the idea of Sierra Club coming in as a representative of nature, that nature itself would have a place in this, in the courtroom, okay? So, you know, in terms of what Sierra Club was hoping was that it could, you know, come forward and really, you know, represent nature as nature in the courtroom. And because of Sierra Club's interests, you know, be seen as a legitimate, you know, stand-in for nature, if you will, or in this case, the Mineral King Valley. Justice Douglas and two other justices, I always forget that they actually was a four to three decision, which is pretty close. Um, Justice Douglas dissented in this case. He had a different view. What did Justice Douglas say? So would Justice Douglas then agree with the, the bouncer that these guys should just be kept out of the courtroom? No. Nope. So he would let him in. And Justice Douglas said, OK. You know, yes, it's really hard to get a mountain in the courtroom. We can't bring the valley down here. The valley has a hard time testifying, right? But in fact, the valley has an interest and in that it really should be Mineral King versus Morton. That it's, the, it's really the harm is accruing to this, this place, not necessarily to people. So the majority says, you know, the only ones who can come into the court are people. People, you know, warm-blooded, you know, homo sapiens. That's the only ones who can bring the claim. And even some of them are limited. Um, the rock stays outside. And Justice Douglas says, well, it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe, you know, the rocks, the trees themselves should have standing. The mountains should have standing. I don't know if I think I wrote down his, his quote. Um, he says, oh, the valleys, the alpine meadows, the rivers, lakes, estuaries, beaches, ridge, groves of trees, swampland, or even air are the parties at interest, and they should be able to have standing. Um, you know, back to my sort of picture frame problem, Justice Douglas loses. He's in the minority in this. Though puts those ideas out there, you know, perhaps ecological ideas to think about, you know, what the harm is. Um, did anybody know what happened with um, Mineral King and the ski resort? Just that curiosity? Davis? There's no resort. Okay, there you go. So what happened is the Supreme Court, even though it said, you know, no, there's no such thing as a Lorax, we're not going to recognize that, we're not going to let you in the door, 
if you had members who were injured, which I think is what Erickson said, if you had members who were them themselves personally injured, then we've got real live human beings who are injured. That looks a lot like what we normally recognize in the courts, and we would let them bring the lawsuit. And Sierra Club, you know, just because we think, you know, you probably just slipped up here, we'll let you go back and amend your what's called a complaint, the thing that was filed in the courts, to actually argue that your members were hurt and that they were injured. So Sierra Club went back, found members like Davis who had hiked there or skied there or spent time there. They talked about how their aesthetic experience, their watching wildlife, their enjoyment of Sequoia National Park, and their spiritual beliefs and all the other ways in which they were harmed. They brought that to court. The court said, yeah, those are real harms. And we've got this new law, the National Environmental Policy Act. And Forest Service and Park Service, you guys have to follow the law. And in that process of evaluating it, the, it seemed clear to a lot of people in the agencies this was a stupid idea. And so they dropped it eventually. So there isn't, there isn't a ski resort there. So in that sense, perhaps the mountain won. In the sense of recognizing nature in the legal system, not so much. OK. So you know, one of the things that Justice Douglas argues is that people who have a meaningful relationship with a place could be the people who could bring this lawsuit. And I think that one of the challenges and one of the reasons why those of us who look at the world through this particular frame struggle with Justice Douglas's attempt to try to merge the biosphere and the ecosphere is that figuring out who has those meaningful relationships becomes challenging. So you know, do I have that meaningful relationship? I've never been to Mineral King. It's one of the things I need to do. That would be a good core course field trip. Um, you know, David, does Davis have that meaningful relationship? Probably. It sounds like it. I mean, maybe I do, because I really want to go there, and it's important, and I can talk all about it, and it's a symbol for me. Does a mining company that wants to come in and dig up Mineral King, because it's got lots of minerals, does that have a meaningful relationship? Maybe. Walt Disney certainly wanted to have a meaningful relationship with it. And so you know, looking in this particular frame that we have, it becomes really complicated. You know, are they the right people? Are all of us the right people to bring that? Can anybody bring it? And if Davis starts to bring it and then he blows it, does that mean that the valley is injured because they had a lame person associated with him? Or sorry, Davis. Um, or if I brought the lawsuit and I was really working for Walt Disney undercover, maybe we could find that out. But as you can see, it's looking through this sort of frame that, that I have from my, my training, it starts, it gets complicated when you try to think about bringing those mountains into the, into the courtroom. Do we have analogies? Yes, Justice Douglas gives you some of them. Um, with ships, we let ships come into the courtroom, not literally, but figuratively. Um, we let corporations come into the, the courtroom. I mean, this thing at least was living once. A corporation was never living. So in terms of like life forms, if my rock does better than a corporation, if that's your criterion. But we let corporations come into our legal system as persons. So Justice Douglas says, well, you know, that's kind of analogous. But it's hard because it's very different than the way that we've thought about the legal system in the past. And there's actually a really interesting movement out there that I, I read their stuff and want it to be really compelling. It's called the Earth Jurisprudence Movement where people are really trying to integrate ecological ideas and legal ideas and something other than environmental law, which is what I'm trained in, what I do. But it's actually a step beyond that. It's to really try to, to bring nature into the court, into the legal system in a meaningful way as 
a subject, not as a, just an object. And I read their stuff because I really want to think about ways to do it, but whenever I read their ecology, I hear John's voice in the back of my head saying, this is not ecology, this is not ecology, these people have never been outside in their life. Um, because the ecology isn't very good for most of this stuff. The ideas are intriguing, but yeah, I mean, the other, I mean, it's, it's a group of people who are sort of at the fringe, and I don't mind people at the fringe. People at the fringe come up with really interesting ideas, but it's not clear to me that their science, that their understanding of ecology is nearly as developed as yours is after just four weeks of being here at a school. And I think that the questions they pose are important ones, but how you work through those is complicated and challenging. Which brings me to the Ecuador Constitution, and then sort of wrap up with that. I put that on the portal. I also, it's on the back of this piece of paper. Because there's been a lot of airplay about the, the Constitution. Um, passed in 2008 by popular referendum, it has some amazing provisions in it where the country of Ecuador has said, you know, we are going to change the relationship between nature and the legal system in our constitution, in our fundamental documents. We're going to try to bring these things together. We're going to make nature a rights-bearing entity. Remember when I said this rock doesn't have rights or responsibilities? They have said, this rock has rights. And particularly Article 71, you know, basically takes Justice Douglas and then goes this one step further in that it's really granting legal standing to any person to defend nature's rights, but also creates these inalienable rights in nature. You know, makes it, again, a subject of their legal system. It may be the first constitution to really do that. There have been some other laws in other places that has tried to do that. But Ecuador puts it in their four fundamental legal documents and say, this is what we want to do, that nature is no longer just an object. It's actually on par with, par with humans in this system. And what makes Ecuador a little bit complicated is that a lot of, the, if you saw in, this, in the title and even in the Spanish, they talk about the um, Pachimama, that you know, the concept is an indigenous people's concept. It's not really a Western legal tradition. And they've merged it into a constitution, which is a Western legal tradition. And those two things don't all sit all together comfortably in that space. One of the things that, for some of us, who are really excited about this possibility, because maybe it actually will you know, bring the two parts of my personality together, so I don't have to you know, go see Rich about this sort of schizophrenia that I suffer. But it really can bring these two things together. But then I look at the language and say, hmm, this really isn't self-executing. It, it's calling on Congress, their Congress, to do something, to create laws that will make this real. It creates standing, maybe. It's not absolutely clear that somebody can come in off the street and speak for a mountain in Ecuador or try to protect the rainforest from Chevron as they drill for oil or protect areas, a river from gold mining. You know, there, it suggests that that's the case, but those cases have not come forward. No one knows what the courts will do with this and how it will play out. Part of why that's important is because again, you know, nature's nature having rights makes sense in a legal framework if they can be enforced. And so waiting to see what happens on the ground in Ecuador, where there's a lot of effort from US corporations, Ecuadorian corporations, Ecuadorian people, legal scholars and others to try to hold this back and say, you know, what are you doing? Do you really know what this means? And people don't know what it means. I think it, you know, my interpretation would be, no, I can still, like, own a rock 
and that this rock you know, can't somehow sue me because I'm picking it up and manhandling it or something. But what does it mean? You know, does and who can represent this rock? Can anybody in the room come up and you know, protect this rock from me if I decide to make it into jewelry? It, you know, it doesn't mean those things. Those things seem pretty trivial. But what does it mean? What could it mean? How could it, how could it really be implemented? And that's why, for me, maybe more so than for you, that frame matters. Because it's hard for me to even totally picture how that could work, though I'm certainly intrigued to try. OK, so where to from here? I told myself I'd leave you guys a half hour for questions. Um, unlike Aldo Leopold, I'm not so sanguine or, or so optimistic about the natural evolution of ethics. I love the land ethic. I think it's beautifully written. I love the ideas in it. I, I love the clarity with which he writes. But I don't know that over time our concept of community is inevitably, inevitably expanding to include more. So he makes that argument, you know, there's sort of slaves now become persons and they're incorporated, and women become persons and they're incorporated, and children, and then you know, maybe animals, and then maybe nature as a whole will be brought in. Um, I don't know that that is inevitable. And certainly looking at what's happened in the world over the last 20 years, certainly the last few years, makes me pause. On that list of statutes, I threw in one thing because I had a tiny bit of space. But it's a quote from someone from the wise use movement. I don't know if you guys have heard about the wise use movement. Um, PR savvy, well-funded, sort of big anti-environmental wave, property rights wave, mostly in the West. But in rural states like Maine, the wise use movement was also really well, I would say was powerful, is still very powerful. There are hearings going on this month in which they'll turn out people. You know, they are, it's sort of married with the Tea Party movement at this point. But I always both was amused by and frightened by the definition one of the founders of the wise use movement uses for property. So he says, property is that which is peculiar, peculiarly, I can't talk, yours. Whether it's your money, your wife, your children, your house, your car, or your real estate. I don't think that Mr. Gertz agrees with Elder Leopold. I, that's just a guess. You know, that, and it would, you know, if it, you, at some level it's hard not to laugh, but at another level, he's dead serious. He really wants to, instead of expanding this notion of who can participate and where nature fits in, you know, to match humans, he actually wants to narrow the group of humans that can participate in this. Um, this fall in Maine, this a same issue is playing out, actually fall into winter. Um, the Republican legislature last year looked at a bill which is called a takings bill, which sort of redefines the role of government vis-a-vis -vis property. And the idea, it's a pretty absolutist view of property. It doesn't go so far as to say that children and, and women are property. What it says is that you know, real property is real property. It's absolute. And government shouldn't do anything to infringe on that. But if it does, it should pay for it. And by infringing on it, I mean, for example, I live in, in town on, on Ledge Lawn in the middle of our harbor, that if I wanted to take advantage of all these tourists, build a 20-story high-rise hotel right there in the middle of town, that that, by God, is my you know, God-given right to property. I should be able to do that. And the fact that the town of Bar Harbor would have the audacity to say all it can have is a single-family house that's you know, worth, I don't know what it is worth these days, but a couple hundred thousand dollars when I can have a $20 million hotel, you know, they're taking away $19.8 million from me of my property. And they should pay me for it, or they should get rid of that law. That's what the main legislature is considering, which sounds sort of crazy. But if you think about property in that way, and we've moved more and more toward that way of thinking, that becomes sort of a, a reality. 
And I would encourage any of you who are interested in these things if, you know, to participate in the conversations both in hearings around the state and in Augusta about some of those questions because they're real and they really have to do a lot with how people view the world. Um, I think that nature comes into society. When I put my legal blinders on, it looks a lot less integrated than it should be and sometimes makes me wonder. I mean, clearly, you know, human society exists in nature, and we're surrounded by nature, we use nature, we're affected by nature. But the ways in which we understand and think about it are really pretty limited. They're caught in a, perhaps a worldview of 200 years ago, perhaps in a worldview that's never really existed before. The absolutism of property doesn't have a lot of historic precedents. It's amazing. But it also has significant economic value. It's not that you know, John Visvader and philosophers sit around saying, well, if we treat this as an object, then the world will be out, fall out this way. It's you know, Conoco or you know, huge mining companies saying, yeah, this is an object. We, want to, we make lots of money from this stuff. We don't want to change those rules. Because if we change those rules, we're going to behave or have to behave very differently. And so I think that the change worldview that Leopold predicts and that in some ways I think is necessary as a human ecologist runs up against some very strong vested interests. And changing worldviews is hard to begin with. But those vested interests make it even harder. You know, the take home message from that, so this isn't a totally depressing lecture, is that I think Leopold's wrong. It's not inevitable. But it, that doesn't mean it's not worth fighting for, or that in fact, if we as a species want to survive and we want this world around us to survive in a way that makes it worth living, then it probably is something that we have to engage in. And I'll take questions. Thanks. And I'm going to drop out of roll because I'm really hot. OK. Yeah, then. You know what, I can't. I've been looking, reading, talking to people who've been involved in the effort, and nothing has really made its way into the court system. Some people have argued that it's changed the political dynamic in Ecuador, but it's hard to know because the reason that the Constitution was changed is because the political dynamic changed in Ecuador. And so I think we're still waiting to see. And there's well, not everybody's waiting to see. There are a lot of people who are using those, those very provisions, trying to get them in other places. Um, Venezuela has talked about something similar. Bolivia has done something s similar um, legislatively. But we're, yeah, I'm sort of anxiously waiting to see how it's going to play out. And I think, in part, trying to, you know, have the legal system sort of process it and see, you know, what does it really mean is a hard question. So, but I, you know, people think in the next year or two, there should be some really critical test cases. And the judiciary in Ecuador, it's hard, you know, politically, this is going to be radical for them. So it'll be interesting to see. But keep posted on, on it. Other questions? Yep. Nope. And, and I think those are good examples, if not 
the legal power and at least the mindset that might be supported. Rich, you had. Maybe. I mean, those laws, so humane laws, so, you know, humane slaughter, you know, what I can do to my pet, um, what I can do to domestic animals. Most people characterize them in some ways as not being so much about the animal's rights, but about what we as humans, what's humane. So when you use the term humane, meaning that you know, it's, it's not so much about the suffering that that animal, you know, I, enjoys isn't the right word, the suffering that animal goes through, but it's the sort of horrible things that me as a person in society, you know, do you really want somebody in society who would take, you know, a brick and beat a dog to death? Because that's not really the sort of person you probably want to live next to because they beat dogs to death. What would they do to children or you, know, you or whatever? And so a lot of those laws actually focus a lot more on the actor than on the, the animal. Um, having said that, the, a lot of the sort of earth jurisprudence people are moving from that way saying, OK, We've recognized that there's suffering in animals, that there's, that there's something there that's in fact different than this rock, that they're sentient. And we recognize that in the legal system, we create mechanisms to deal with it. Couldn't we broaden that out? So yeah, it is, it is a relevant thing, but not definitive, if that makes sense. I don't know enough of the people, but and is that Kate? Yeah. And you're right, there's a cause and effect relationship. Some of the horrendous things, I think it was Texaco originally, and then Chevron took over for them, um, which involved you know, poisoning of local villages, really bad water pollution, some incredible devastation. Um, you know, inspired some of the, the revolt slash reform that brought along the Constitution. At the same time, my understanding is that Ecuador needs that oil for foreign exchange. And so they're a little bit in a bind, particularly between indigenous groups and this desire to keep their economy afloat. And so that it's, it's really contested. You know, the, the best interpretation is that the work that's going on now is much better, that protects local communities, is not as devastating. Oil production, almost by definition, is hard for it not to be devastating, not to have those impacts. And so I, I don't know what it's like on the ground. I've read accounts from both sides saying that it is actually much better um, now. Um, but I've also heard you know, human rights group, Amazon Watch, and others have said it's still really problematic, and the government's not doing enough. So, but it's a good case. you know. Partially because it matters. It's easy to enforce laws about things that don't matter, you know, to pick on minorities or that don't have any economic power or political power. But with something that matters like this is probably the real test case for what these laws will mean. Yeah. Sorry. There's and, uh, you that well, yeah. You know. But part of it, you know, the same thing is, you know, this rock might have a lot to say about me. I don't know, break this. But if I beat this rock and break it, it might have a lot to say. But if it can't go anywhere to say that, then. Yeah. 
Yeah. They do have those things. It's you know partially whether they would have the legal framework in which to you know if you believe this, and I, and I don't know if he really does, but maybe if you really believe it, then they certainly don't have any redress in terms of sort of legal stuff. But God, sorry, um, Elizabeth, then why don't we go that way? Um, yes, it was really hard to find after 73. Um, there are a couple things, I think, so what changed? Um, some of my colleagues could probably help me with this. I think partially is that certain economic interests woke up. They looked at this endangered species thing and said, well, this isn't just about you know, a few eagles or grizzly bears. This is really about fundamentally reordering priorities. And you, know, you stop a $90 million dam for a little fish, that's crazy. And so I think that you know, prior to 1973, you didn't have a lot of corporate anti-environmental lobbyists. There's, I mean, that's a huge sector of what happens in Washington. I think the amount of money that goes into elections is even worse than ever. Um, I think the political economy in some ways you know, one of the things, you know, I malign the earth jurisprudence people as being a little bit fruity, you know, but part of it is that everything you hear in society talks about sort of ownership. And George Bush talked about the ownership society, right? That that's what we are. We're defined by owning things as opposed to belonging things. And when people say we're the ownership society, it's like, oh, yeah, damn straight. It's my rock. I'd, you know, I'm going to use it. As no one stood up and said, well, do we really own the earth? Well, maybe some people did, but they were like, you know, did extraordinary rendition and took them away. I mean, people didn't say, do we really own the earth? And so in some ways, I mean, I'd like to blame it on corporations that would make this cleaner. But I think that it's a much broader way in which we conceive of ourselves as people, as citizens. And so, yeah, which makes it all that much harder to sort of fix. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm from up in New York, and so they do hydroplaning. Fracking, yeah. Um, and I guess it's something that I've been thinking a lot about is the uh, Albert Mutual. Um, and I don't really know that much about it, and I'm wondering if you can sort of explain it to me what it's actually doing. You know, I don't actually know if I can do that off the top of my head. Um, I should be able to, because I've read about it, and but part of me is in denial, because I look at it and say, oh, that just makes no sense at all. So you guys, do you know, all know what fracking is? This process, hydraulic fracturing, where there's bits of methane gas, natural gas, relatively clean fossil fuel, I suppose, that's in layers of shale that extends throughout the Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, a little bit into some of the surrounding states. And you can get that gas out not by doing just a traditional well, but by drilling a well, blasting, literally by pouring, you know, pushing hydraulic fluids down in it, which are mostly water, but also a bunch of other chemicals that lubricate the process. And it's those lubricating chemicals that are particularly problematic. Um, the movie Gasland is not unbiased, but is not a bad way to understand the issue. One of the things that's really tricky, this gets back to some property laws, is a lot of those places, people who own the surface of land don't own the land underneath. And so they have no say in terms of what happens. Other places, people you know, are offered money on failing farms because they can't make a living growing things. And so sort of economically, they have no choice without knowing that the fracking could destroy their groundwater or affect streams that they use for cattle and things like that. And the Halliburton provision is partially, it limits liability. But I actually don't know enough of the details about it. And I should. Gray, are you going to answer that for me? OK. <laughs>
I think that they do provide really interesting models. The thing that I haven't seen done successfully, and maybe Ecuador will be the exception, is how you integrate those two legal systems. It seems, and you know better than I do in Mexico, it seems that whenever those two legal systems conflict, when they, when they overlap or somebody's disinterested because there's nothing really there, it's okay. It's when they, there are valuable resources there or the rich people from Mexico City want to build the, you know, the big hotel. It seems that the, the Western legal system tends to trump whatever that indigenous system is. And so the question for me is, can those two things somehow interact, integrate, or act cooperatively so that they learn from each other and respect those? Or if they're really such different worldviews that you can be in one or you can be in the other, but you can't be in both? And that's a question. And I think that, you know, do I... I don't know that I see that, John may take offense at this, but I don't know that I see that as being that different than the natural historian, because in some ways, those indigenous legal systems and cultures have developed from thousands of years of observing and interacting with nature, um, and recognition maybe that of those principles, not in a sense of Darwin or in a sense of you know, Leopold, but of recognizing those principles. But I think, yes, I think that that's one of the more interesting things. And the world is starting to rep, you know, recognize and try to protect some of those indigenous rights. Um, but whenever the two conflict, it seems that the indigenous worldview loses, certainly in this country, but maybe elsewhere, too. But be, I think that's a great place to look. I, yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree that that economic pressure will be there. There are instances, both in other countries and in this country, where legal rights have stood up to that. Um, probably not as many as you'd like or need. I mean, I think where you actually have a, a well-developed you know, rule of law civil society that can, can actually enforce those things. You know, Endangered Species Act is probably the best example here. Um, where you actually had this concept of the value of a species, not an individual, but a species, being more important than you know, a dam in northern Maine or than um, you know, a, a naval test station or a bunch of other things. Um, but those are probably the exceptions. Nope, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't disagree with that for a second. That doesn't mean, again, law can be aspirational. It doesn't mean that 
we can't aspire to something better. It's 4 o'clock, so I don't want to keep people beyond that. I'll stick around here and answer questions if people have it. I would love to be argued with. These are real questions for me. I would love any insights that people have, because it's part of my challenge to think about how to incorporate the ideas John and Rich and Catherine and others have into the worldview that I have. So thanks. <laughs>